Welcome everyone and thank you for spending time with us um, lunchtime on a Wednesday. Um, as Maria said, my name is Steve Hearson. I am, uh, what am I? I'm a consultant, I'm a facilitator, I'm a coach, I'm a supervisor. I'm not a moral philosopher, I'm not an ethicist. Um, I'm here in my role as a consultant, as a practitioner, trying to make sense of my own inquiry into ethics and consulting and to share some of my reflections and my experiences with you and to give you an opportunity to inquire amongst yourselves and in yourself uh, relative to your own um, ethics and morals and your stance as a, as a practitioner or consultant, however you describe yourself. So what's coming is approximately 30 minutes of me, um, followed by a good chunk of time for inquiry because an hour and a half of me, quite frankly, would bore me senseless, and I'm sure you don't want an hour and a half of me either. Um, so, let us begin. I'm gonna share my screen so we can get into this. There is, a, I guess, a question here about where did this conversation or this inquiry start with? Um, Steve Phillips, who's actually, I see on my little screen here, uh, responded when I first posted this, yeah, wave to the crowd, Steve. Um, responded when I first posted this on LinkedIn. Uh, you said, Steve, what a great topic. Look forward to it and some personal soul, soul searching has also been provoked by just imagining the discussion, unquote. And, you know, my own soul searching, I've had quite a bit as I've chewed on this in the last few months. My hope is, is that you have some soul searching today because just me talking at you, I think is, is not sufficient. Um, it shouldn't be entirely comfortable, this kind of conversation. There should be a useful discomfort as we chew on these things. And I guess my, my invitation to you is, is, if it's not a little bit uncomfortable, then what are we not paying attention to? Or are we so enlightened as consultants that we have no doubt anymore about who we are and how we show up with our clients and what the basis for our practice is? So if I think about also one of the labels I carry, which is, you know, organisational development. Some of you know that I was co-chair of the OD Network for three years, to, sorry, the OD Network Europe. And, you know, the debates I've had in that space around ethics and morals have been quite interesting. You know, OD as a, as, a, as a field of practice has values which are humanistic. They tend to be democratic. We talk about ruthless compassion. And yet, even in that discrete field, you know, I've observed there being tensions and I'll just give you one example of, of my own reflections on this at an OD conference about three years ago in Amsterdam I sat in a room with about 30 peers where we were talking about the shadow side of practice and we were talking about difference and this was a almost entirely monochrome group um, and at one point somebody said no I don't see difference um, to the slight discomfort of the couple of people there who are not white and I said at one point um, I've never heard anybody in OD acknowledge it's entirely possible to be a highly skilled and effective OD consultant and simultaneously to be misogynistic, sexist, homophobic, racist or anything else. Now I've asked that question in a number of different OD spaces, but it's interesting I've never actually had a clear response to that answer and that's probably because there isn't a clear answer. It's a profoundly uncomfortable question. It invites us to reflect on that part of ourselves that if we're really honest we may not want to look at. I've been the last year I've been part of a white men's group which has fallen out of some anti-racist group within the ODNE network and some of the conversations in that have been really quite crunchy and quite uncomfortable and it's that discomfort that I'm speaking from I guess today. Um, so the inquiry that I'm in at the moment that I'm sharing with you is something that I guess you know, could take in stuff like anti-racism work, it could take in some very business-like stuff. So I'm just going to ground this a little bit in a, in a couple of examples of, of my own experiences where this has been sharpened. Um, my, my lovely supervisor, Jean Newman, is also on this call. So um, Jean will have plenty of material for our session next week, no doubt, out of this. But one of the things that I was sharing with Jean, which she helped me with in a session earlier this year, was a client engagement I had where this year I, I kind of came up against an ethical wrestle. So with a colleague, um, we were engaged to do a piece of work to do some internal development of consulting skills and the requirement or the request of the client was that we do some diagnostic work as a prerequisite. The client said well you do part of it and I'll do the rest and then what then happened was the client didn't follow through on that 
And myself and my colleague, who was also on this call, interestingly, uh, this session today, walked into a session that rapidly across three days went totally pear-shaped. And the reason in, in some part that that happened was because we overrode, certainly I overrode, my own discomfort at not having followed through on that important piece of diagnostic work. And what was that discomfort? That discomfort was I knew at some level the appropriate and right thing to do was to hold to, we will not do this work without some diagnostics, some inquiry to find out from the people who are going to, to, rock, to rock up in these sessions what's actually going on. I learned from that. This week I lost a piece of work. I lost a piece of work because I was asked to do a session next Tuesday and the client was absolutely insistent that I just turn up and facilitate a session with a team that's in having some difficulty. And I basically said, I'll do it, but I won't do it with diagnostics. Um, and I've not got that work. And part of me, the part of me that wants to pay the bills is disappointed. The part of me that believes I know what is appropriate for in this context and what's appropriate practice and what, the, what my ethics are, is really pleased that I had the awareness this time to hold my ground. And that will come up again. So there are other ethical wrestles I've had, but those are just two to, to, to bring, bring us into relief. So one of the things to say is there, there is a wider debate to be had about chartered institutes, professional bodies and certification and accrediting, and that's, that has its place. And I'm going to touch on that. Um, but however you're accredited, whatever process you've gone through, somebody once said no plan survives contact with the enemy. And it's actually at some dispute as to who actually said that. Well, I'd argue that no accreditation or charter will survive contact necessarily with your client or the client system. So, you know, these things are useful, but they're not sufficient. So my starting point in a moment is going to be that inner wrestle. But I'm going to be really clear. I'm not going to invite us to spend the entire time having a lovely OD like inquiry into our own internal landscape and what we value and what we believe and what matters to us in isolation from what clients are actually looking to us for. So I'm actually going to spend a fair amount of time looking at some of the research that tells us what clients are looking for in people like us, whatever our label. And then we come to, and so how do my ethics and my morals stand up against that and in light of that? So I'm just going to ask you for a moment to pause and to breathe. And I've got a question I'm going to ask you. I'd like you to reflect on a client engagement or conversation that you've had at some point, recent or past, where you were challenged, where your ethics or your values or your principles or your morals, whatever label you choose for that part of you, where you felt something in you was challenged. And what I'd like you to do, as you sift for that, is nutshell it. It may be a word, fairness, justice, performance. It could be a sentence. And I'd like you to just put it in the chat, please, if you're willing. What's the most important ethical principle that guides your work? And as you see these come in, you'll be in conversation with some of your colleagues. Um, you can always copy and paste the chat and the names, and you can then see how it feels to be with people in your group who've said that maybe their value is integrity or transparency. And how does that show up in your conversations with them? So thank you for putting those in. So a brief agenda. So I'm going to frame ethics in the context of our conversation today. Then I'm going to talk about what organisations think they are buying, which is boils down to really ultimately a couple of things, experts and expertise, and some of what influences that. And then I'm going to get into the shadow side of this, the peeling the onion of this stuff, um, before we get on to the implications for practice, where we have some inquiry together. So as with these things, you know, let's go for a, a dictionary definition. You know, one, one 
option, as I said, would have been to go straight for this internal wrestle about you know, my relationship with ethics, my own uh, ethical stance. And as we see here, you know, any definition of ethics starts to talk about moral principles that govern a person's behaviour. Part of the problem with that is, is that you, know, you could argue, um, in some senses, that some of the most horrible people on the planet have, have had ethics. I'm half German. I mean, Adolf Hitler had a certain kind of ethics that I wouldn't subscribe to. So, you know, ethics is more than simply what we believe to be right or good. It's, it's what the impact is on people beyond ourselves. And our ethics are only meaningful in our context relative to the client need and our relationship with that client and the impact that we will have through relating with those people in that organisation. So, what do organisations actually think they're buying? Various studies, including a 2019 meta-analysis of recent research, found that organisations are looking for, really, ultimately, three things. They're looking for experts, in this case, experts in building dams. They're looking for expertise, um, the ability to gnaw trees into the relevant shape and to lug them around and to build said dams. And they're looking for somebody who's got the ability to design bespoke solutions. But in short, organisations are actually buying expertise. People who know their stuff and know how to customise it to their situation or their problem. And that implies that they think they're buying an expert who understands that context or situation. So three factors that actually have been found to influence um, or that most influence clients buying behaviour are these three things. It is that thing about expertise and this is the interesting bit, the perception of the consultant's expertise and I shall come back to that and talk about it in more detail. Some sense of a common vision and the intensity of the collaboration or the relationship. Um, the perception thing is interesting. A few years ago, I had a, a, a group I was working with in an insurance business, helping an internal change team. And I asked the group at the beginning, have you got any questions for me? And one of the people in the group said, well, why should we listen to you? My immediate response was to laugh. And I said, well, you shouldn't. Because there's something here about, you know, not accepting the projections onto me that I have all the answers. The most important thing, though, that clients look for is indeed the expert. They want the expert in a particular discipline. And here is where we get to one of the kind of crunchy ethical questions right at the outset. Your client says to Steve, you're an expert in developing consulting skills for people who are doing transformation organisations. Brilliant. What happens if Steve isn't an expert in that? What happens if you as a consultant know that, yeah, you know some stuff, but hand on heart, you are not an expert? What do you do? Do you walk away? Do you tell the client that actually you're not really actually that skilled in that, but you do know people who are and you'll happily recommend them? What do you do? And if you say here and here and now that you, you will walk away, I guess my question would be, have you always walked away? If you think back, a number of us on this call are you know, not in our 20s or 30s. Think back over your career. Have you always walked away when a client has asked whether you have an expertise for something? Or have you done what you might now consider to be the ethical thing? So let's get into the shadows side of this and the defences. And I'm going to suggest there's four issues. There are many more, by the way, but there's four that I'm focusing on. The first thing is, well, what exactly is an expert? You know, it's interesting when you do a search on a, on a picture library, what images come up for expert? These are some of the imagery that, that actually shows up when you do a search for that word online. It's fascinating how we socially construct certain concepts and we turn those into our, our meaning making about what an expert is and is not. The word itself originally comes from the Latin ex experiae, which comes from the word for experience. And it translates literally as experienced in or having experience of. Another ethical question. Do all of us in this session, when we work with clients, are we genuinely experienced in the thing it is we are helping our clients to do? If I reflect in the here and now, when I think about some of the conversations I facilitate with clients, you know, I'm working with a number of people in the NHS at the moment. I have some expertise and some experience in collaboration and facilitating change and facilitating dialogue. I don't have expertise at all in some of the, the challenges that these people are facing in the NHS and certainly around COVID. I don't have that. So 
An expert as conceived in its original sense is someone whose fluency or of skill in a given domain is grounded in an accumulated set of experiences in that domain. So if you go back far enough, you'll find one of the earliest examples of that word expert appearing in Chaucer's work in the 1300s. So he talked about an expert in love and science. But one of the things that you need to notice in this is that though areas of expertise are varied, the process of becoming an expert remains largely the same. In theory, one simply had to accumulate enough related experience through which the necessary skills could be developed and perfected. Again, do we have the necessary skills for what it is we say we practice with clients? So that then brings us to another question. How are experts different to novices? Well, the term novices, um, as it is currently used, did not begin to emerge until well into the 20th century. Sorry, the term experts. Uh, in once in the 20th century, when you start to look at the cognitive sciences revolution, some of the research that was done in the 1960s by a chess master looked at the differences between expert and novice players. He wanted to know, this was a chess player called Adrian de Groot, whether chess masters used qualitatively different mental processes during the matches than their less expert counterparts. So to research his question, he asked both novice and expert players to talk out loud as they decided on their strategies on their next moves. And using an analysis of recordings of these dialogues, he began analysing the content of their thought processes. What he found was few any differences in the actual thought processes employed by novices and experts. So he failed to see anything that would indicate why experts made the correct move as opposed to a novice most of the time. So further research built on this then. So what does this all mean? What can we say that actually distinguishes the very best experts from those who might be called or self-identified as novices. We know that experts and novices can see the same words in a problem, or chess pieces on a board, or maybe notes in a musical score. The difference, the key difference, is that experts see the words, pieces or notes within a context of accumulated experience, knowledge and wisdom. And I think that's fascinating. Because that then starts to talk to patterns, as Jackie, you've just said there quite rightly. We're now getting to the territory of being able to, to, to see patterns. Um, and I love this, this last bit here, you know, experts see differently. Oops. If we then look at the concept of expertise, which is another little part of this, um, the main problem with this is that the literature actually doesn't have a commonly accepted definition of expertise. So some researchers have pointed out that however you might define expertise, it's generally assumed that experts possess a unique combination of innate talents and the motivation necessary for a certain rigorous training or practice to require to achieve the level of excellence that you say you're an expert in. So whilst you, know, you have a definition like, this, this one you have here. It helps to clarify our understanding of the construct, but it's like any definition, it reduces a complex phenomenon into a few highlights. It doesn't really get into the complexity of what we're talking about. It's like a snapshot picture of something. It's an oversimplification. Nonetheless, there seems to be an, a growing um, uh, consensus that experts can be identified by a limited set of well-studied and established characteristics that can be generalized across different domains. So one piece of research, which was from these researchers, suggested that there were a number of characteristics that experts share. And I'm not going to read these out verbatim, there's nothing more boring than somebody reading out a slide. And I allow you to scan those briefly. And when you look at these characteristics and you start comparing yourself to them, if there is some truth in this, it may not be an absolute truth, how do you compare? As I read this, do I think I have a superior memory based on my ability to remember people's names? Absolutely not. I don't think I do have a superior memory. So how are we comparing ourselves to what is apparently the characteristics that experts share? 
It also begs the question, can anyone become an expert or do those who obtain the status of an expert in their field harbour some special characteristics that place them head and shoulders above others? And this comparison thing, I think, then starts to get interesting when we think about experts as opposed to gurus. So you may recognise some of the figures here, and I very deliberately picked people who, in, in my experience, some of them seem to cultivate a sense of guruness. So if you look at Simon Sinek's feed on LinkedIn, um, it's very much the behaviour of somebody who seems to be set up as a guru, whether they intended that or not. Frederick Leloux, I know, is perceived by some as a guru for his work in reinventing organisations. I've spoken to people who work in that kind of space who say, yes, that is how he is seen. But equally, I've spoken to people who've interviewed him and he actually really doesn't like being seen as a guru. Naomi Stanford on the bottom left there. So I first heard about Naomi when I was at Roffey Park. Now, she was regarded at the time as the person to talk to about organisation design. She was a regular visitor. In my early days there, I was intimidated by her reputation. You know, the many books she has written. Um, you know, am I a good enough consultant? How will I possibly compare to her? I've got to know Naomi in recent years. I interviewed her for a book I'm writing and we talked about loads of stuff. And one of the things that I've now learned about Naomi, she's humble, she's witty, she's generous and she's rare, a rare thing. She's an expert who's always learning, evolving and challenging her own thinking and sharing it as she goes. And her own view of the label guru is interesting. She said to me, I reject that concept, but in the Middle East, that's what the colleague I work with there sells me as. But I think my personality quickly dispels the myth that I have all the answers, but as I keep on saying, I haven't a clue. No one has any answers. So I'm an expert in not having any answers. So similarly, Jervis Bush, who's in the bottom of the middle there. So he's quite keen to disabuse others of the notion he's a guru. I spoke to him as well, and he recognised that whilst people will make stuff up based on what they've read or heard about him, He's had to come to terms with that. It kind of goes with the territory and it happens with clients to him as well. He said to me, I'll get clients coming at me where there's, there's that initial sort of thing, which I try really hard to disabuse as quickly as possible. And he's talking there about the guru thing. Dave Ulrich, top left, huge name in HR. If you talk to him, he's one of the most south of acing and generous and open people you can hope to meet. And he's somebody else who, during my research and, and conversations, who struggles with what's projected onto him in terms of the status and a story he's not comfortable with. So remember that description earlier on of experts who see the words, pieces or notes within the context of accumulated experience, knowledge and wisdom. Compare this to how Dave sees his work. He said to me, quote, I hope I create ideas that will have impact, that build on the past, that rely on relevant theory, that are research based and that are useful. If someone labels them a silver bullet, that is more their agenda to likely discount my ideas and promote theirs. I get frustrated by misrepresentation of my ideas, but it is what it is." Unquote. So many experts know the risks of colluding with the fantasies and projections of their clients, and there are those that indulge their clients and audiences uh, using that adulation to elevate their status and their reputation, and arguably managing and maintaining their own anxiety. And again, amongst us, how many of us have at moments elevated our own status to manage our own anxiety? I can certainly hold my hand up. I can think there are moments in my career where I probably elevated my status because I needed to manage my own anxiety to somehow appear more than maybe I felt I was. Ask yourself, have you ever played the guru card? If you have, what ethical question might actually raise that for you, raise for you? To what extent does your ego play a role in all this? Particularly if you meet a client who you might label as helpless or needing help. One of the things that came to mind as I was doing my last minute prep for this was a book written a few years ago by this guy Dan Gardner and it's actually about how risk is perceived and um, framed in the media and by politicians and one thing that came back to me was some, something in the book where he talks about experts and the experts that actually are put into the media and are given high profile visibility and he observed that the experts that are most commonly the ones that are put onto TV and in the media are the most polished are the most confident, are the ones who assert things. But what the research that he did showed was that those experts were no more accurate than a toss of a coin, pretty much. They were not very good at forecasting. The experts that were good at forecasting were the ones who maybe were a little bit more nerdy, less polished for the camera, 
less likely to be invited to be interviewed. So think about that for a moment in terms of what organisations do. Who do they tend to go for? They won't go for the unpolished consultant. They will often go for the most polished consultant because it reassures them and it enables them to project onto them that they know what they're doing. And it reminds me of when I did my master's years ago, one of my friends on that course was a guy called Pete Hamill, who's written a book on embodied leadership and does loads of embodied work. And he said to me, as we were driving there one, one morning to Surrey, he said, one of the things that you've got is you've got a face which allows people to project onto whatever it is they're imagining. You don't give much away. And that's really interesting. You know, if I allow my clients to project onto me to whatever they're imagining, and that's perceived as being a useful thing for a consultant, there's a real, again, ethical tension there. Will I allow my client to project onto me something that isn't true because I want the business? So just to bring it into kind of the ego state for the moment, um, into our egos, Alistair Wiley, um, who some of you may know, um, was describing to me a, a, an idea he had when he was thinking about the consulting modes that sometimes get spoken about. And he suggested that when we have an expert consultant, that's the parent and adult ego states of the consultant addressing the child. The client says, I need somebody to fix it for me. The consultant obliges. The pair of hands, the client, knows what they want, the parent and adult in them will tell the consultant, do what I ask. The collaborative is the adult to adult. And I guess I offer this just as part of my own reflections into where am I with my clients? And when am I actually being an adult with them? And when am I being invited into actually not being in an adult relationship with them? And what might that raise as ethical challenges? Just briefly, some Four of the primary conflicts and tensions that um, research has shown that we, have, we face. And I think these also raise some ethical questions. Um, so again, I won't read these out, but notice what these evoke in you as you scan them. And the ethical issues that might be embedded in those. And lastly, I want to take head on this question about, well, you know, we can handle the ethics thing by having a competency framework. So last week, or the week before, as I was prepping for this, I did a wee search. I thought, let's have a look and see what's out there um, in terms of places you could become accredited as a consultant. One of the things I found was this, the International Council of Management Consulting Institutes. That's a statement on their website. It's a global community that's trusted, ethical and committed. When you become certified, you've shown that you have the knowledge, competence, commitment and peer acceptance. You're a true professional. And then down at the bottom there, that line, a higher level. I thought that's quite interesting. You know, these people are all clearly highly ethical, know what they're doing. And then I looked at some of the people that they have as members. This is all in the public domain. I'm not casting aspersions against them. But, you know, in the public domain, you see that Grant Thornton, maybe had some ethical challenges when they were working with Patisserie Valerie. You have PwC, fined over a lack of competence. Deloitte stung for something else. Large consulting firms, who apparently have signed up to a charter, have some ethical challenges. So my contention is, is, is that the charters are all well and good, but it unfolds ultimately a level of the individual practitioners and consultants and their own ethical choices. There was um, a consultant I interviewed um, yesterday, sorry, the day before yesterday, who is an ex-consultant from one of the biggest consulting firms on the planet. Um, he said to me in this conversation, a couple of years ago, I got to a point in my career that saying, why do what, what it is that I'm actually doing? Why do I do what it is that I'm actually doing? Why do I get up in the morning? Why do I go to work? And for me, it just became an issue because I, what I realised is I only got up in the morning to go to get my paycheck, not because I was passionate about what I was doing. I think it really came down to is that I don't believe we ever, ever tried to add true value to what our customers really need. Because what I think what I learned with the big consulting firms is that if the client has got a problem, we never challenge that problem. We don't know if we're actually solving the right problem. 
will consult to everything you'd like us to, you know, it's just a matter of price. The ethical issue for me was we were happy to take all the millions, but we never questioned whether we were doing the right thing. And I don't think that's unusual. You know, I've spoken to a number of people in large consulting firms in my research in the last year or so. And the typical reason they leave large consulting firms, good as they are at what they do, and they do great work in many, in many instances, is because of ethical reasons. Mm. So, you know, we have a question here about, you know, are the big consulting firms any better than the small consulting firms or vice versa? Are the ethical challenges of the, or the, the, um, the complaints we could make about the big and the small any different? I'd argue in some respects not. I think it's really easy to set up a straw man, the PWCs or the Baines of this world are somehow uh, not as ethical as the Steve Hearsons um, or any of the other consultants on this session today. But I'm not convinced. I don't believe that we're all white knights in shining armour and saints. I think that there's a lot more that we do as independents that actually could arguably be questionable in small and large ways. And I'll give you one specific example. Many independent consultants I see put up on their websites that they have lots of associates that actually are just about one man or one woman operations. For me, that's a little bit of an ethical tension because I don't believe I can say I have lots of associates. I've got a network and so that's what I say I have. But when do we actually present ourselves as being far bigger than we actually are and fluffing ourselves up? You might say to me, well, Steve, that's just marketing. That's, that's maybe true in your view. I'd suggest it's also sitting in there as a lurking ethical question as well. So the so what to all this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago, this appeared in the New York Times. And I guess I'm bringing this right now down to the, to the thing I said earlier on. The ethical questions will ultimately arrive in our laps as individual human beings and we can project it onto the organizations and the large entities as much as we like but that quote at the bottom was a letter signed by i think it was a dozen mckinsey consultants who were wrestling with their own ethical tear about what they felt about their employer and what it was doing in the world so these ethical questions that we face are deeply personal and they are relative to what our clients ask us to do. So the conversation and the inquiry that I'm going to suggest maybe that we slowly shift into is this one as a round one. What patterns are you seeing and noticing? Um, well, I'm seeing I've got a typo in the second one now. So as a former employee of The Guardian, um, I'd like to apologise for that. Um, so, yeah. I see, a, I see a pattern of typos. What questions are coming up for you as, you as you've listened to me talk? And what has either been reconfirmed or challenged in your own mind as this conversation has begun to, to, to unfold and we're beginning to talk? So, Maria, would you be willing to put people into small groups and put me in as well? Um, and if we go for initially, um, let's go for, for, for 20 minutes. Welcome back, everybody. So we're going to have five to ten minutes, probably near ten minutes of um, just an opportunity to hear whatever reflections you wish to share from your conversations. So what's what's um, what's going on for you that you'd be willing to share with colleagues? So throw your hand in the air or wave frantically at me via the Zoom screen. For those of us that held on to the very end, Steve, what was the question you've just posed? Um, the question was, um, uh, what what would you be willing to share from your conversations? What reflections have you got? I can share just Go for it, Jackie. Uh, yeah. I suppose we had a, a beautiful conversation actually. So thank you to, to people in the group. For me, um, consultancy is about meaning making and the, the central, I suppose, ch challenge might be is we might have our personal values and what are what is the purpose of consultancy and, and in the system, whatever system that might be that we're working in, that we are going to inevitably 
there's an expectation there. So um, as consultants, is it about, you know, not being central with expertise and coming in with all the answers, but helping to make meaning that is useful, that is between people in those moments, but perhaps stretching beyond that initial concern of, you know, that, that tension of, am I going to get paid for this? what's my point in this it's actually about well what's the purpose of this and why why am I here in this collective and what are we doing so I think there's a tension there because centrally capitalism is exchange you have a um supply and demand and so what are we supplying as consultants and what's the demand and until you, you talk about that you can't make meaning out of this thanks Jackie others yeah, there was something that uh, we are also, thanks Timothy and Lubna, lovely conversation. One of the things we talked about was how difficult it can be to take a stand on something on ethical grounds and how sometimes we might play another card. I'm not skilled to do this. I don't have the competence. I'm not available rather than have the conversation about ethics rather than say, I'm going to not do this piece of work because I think there is some problematic ethical issues. Um, so we, the conversation was around, you know, what's at risk for us if we stick our head above the parapet um, on ethical grounds? Thanks, Helen. I have, I was just had a thought um, following on from what Helena said. Um, you know, often one is confronted with a, what feels like an ethical question. The, um, you know, somebody says something unpleasant or something that offends um, something racist or sexist or whatever it might be. And the dilemma is whether to respond instantly or whether to try and find out two things. One is, what does the group do with this problem, if anything? And is the problem perhaps the passivity in the group around controversy? Um, and when and how to um, experience enough of the discomfort about what's been said so that one has something useful to say rather than moralistic. And that's the danger about being ethically pure, that you become um, uh, like the novice in the picture, sort of pure, um, rather than dirty. I like the word dirty in the phrase. What's interesting, Julian, what that spark for me is, you know, some of you I hear, I know Jeff does, um, knows uh, Richard Clayton, who's an interesting chap based in Hong Kong. Um, and Richard talks very eloquently about the concept of dirty consulting, um, which is this, this idea that rather than a suited and booted, booted and extremely polished PowerPoint wielding consultant, that what the client is best served by is the consultant who turns up in a more dirty fashion and says, look, I don't know what the problem is and you don't. You and I together with your people will have a conversation where we might work out what the problem is and then together we might, might work out what we do with it. And actually, in many contexts, I'd argue that is really ultimately what's needed, um, but is eschewed, avoided and denied. Because it's messy and it doesn't collude with the certainty and with the idea that an expert may have a solution. You're also assuming perhaps that people know what the problem is. So if you've got people, you know, in that that moment, are you, are you bringing something different into that to, to perhaps look at a, a different position? Because very often my experience is the problem that presents is not actually not actually what would be best use. What would be best use to me? To me. It's an interesting one, Jackie. I guess. It's an interesting one, Jackie. I guess we've got an echo again. We've got. Um, is that you know what immediately came to mind is the the several series of undercover boss that ran in various countries. The single lesson from which was that the boss didn't know what was going on and what the solution was until he or she went and talked talk to people who were doing the work. Um, so maybe both things are true simultaneously.
I think the other assumption is that people hire consultants because they want actually a solution. Um, sometimes they hire consultants for other reasons, like because somebody at board level has said, have you had this checked out by a consultant? Or because the senior executives are, are totally petrified of getting something wrong and therefore they hire and spend a large sum of money with a consultancy because then when the board says what went wrong, it's, well, I don't know, but I hired McKinsey. I mean, what can I do sort of thing? So it can be that people hire consultants for very different reasons. I think, um, I think one of the things that, that goes with that idea of hiring consultants for different reasons is, is also in the same people. So I think we deal a lot with organisations where leaders think there's something they want to do, but whether they then actually have the will uh, to do it or uh, are feel too challenged by it to do it, we'd sometimes have that kind of, um, are we colluding in that way with organisations who are saying they want to do something but actually aren't, aren't unconsciously that willing to engage in it um, or do it. And the other thing that came to mind from something somebody just said is a, a maxim of consulting. I was taught on a how to be a consultant course once, uh, which was the was the idea of you know what about people not knowing what they what they need and the uh, and the idea of perhaps needing to give people what they need in terms of what they want. And sometimes I think you know is that a kind of compromise if we're helping give people what they might need, but in terms of what they want, or are we just helping? Them? to move and the other maxim that went with that which is similar is that is the golden rule of giving somebody a lift somewhere is that you have to pick them up from where they are um, rather than when you're where you're starting from and, and so i wonder whether that's also you know is that part of there's a risk that we just collude by giving ourselves that excuse um, but there's that kind of ongoing tension and judgment about about whether we're trying to do something useful by going to where someone else is that might not be where they you know, where they might need to be well it's interesting steve what that's just sparked for me is you know, a few of you know that the book i'm writing is to do with uh, the functional collusion that exists between clients and organizations and various people who service them including consultants people like us as well that there is ever a quick fix or a guaranteed solution um you know and that's that is out there. You know, there is a kind of collusion that that goes on. Clients do want and like often the idea that somebody has got the answer. It's very reassuring to. Believe and I think that's that. my. I, to that. Well, that's what I wonder, Steve. Do we? Is it? Is it unethical? Is it wrong? Is it deceptive to put a to put our dirty consulting? in a in a nice crisp box somehow you know is a trojan a trojan consulting horse of a box you well, know which if people open well, it once they've pulled it inside their office and they open it they find dirty consultants inside. so that steve that's um thank you for that your your checks in the post because that's the perfect jump, jump off to the next conversation i'd like to invite you to have so we're going to go into breakout steve together. i noticed mark had his hand up for quite a oh, while whilst you. people Sorry, were talking so going. mark do you want to oh. maybe give us the last oh. comment Yes, having an attack of politeness. I, I really <laughs> almost, almost joining together those last two points. Um, I wonder if there's something about the marketing process in terms of actually what you're selling. So am I selling, I have the answer or, I'm, or am I selling an enabling to find the answer? And I also wonder with the ethical thing, whether it really is about um, pure versus dirty or whether the ethical question, ethical conversation with the client might actually be a really important starting point. Um, actually, sort of sorting out the ethics is a key part of sorting out the process. Yeah, which goes right to the, to the, the whole contracting phase. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, and again, from, a, from a, 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 an ethical point of view, what my experience of working extensively in recent years with people who are developing consulting skills as internals, consistently, the thing that people come out of those development um, experiences saying is the thing they have learned above all else is the importance of rigorous contracting and yeah. getting, crun uh, getting crunchy in that phase, yeah. which in turn reveals the deficit of that type of conversation in organisations. So here's the question, one question for you um, for a last, and if we go Maria for about 12 minutes, um, 
is a very simple question which is going in the chat. What are the implications, if any, for your practice of the conversation today? And if I was to sharpen it slightly, you know, it's very easy to come to one of these things and go, well, that was great. You know, Steve chanted on and there were some conversations in the breakouts, but really nothing changes. If you're really honest with yourself, what have you heard today that actually might raise a question for you in terms of how you currently see your practice or your relationship with clients that maybe is slightly uncomfortable or is ripe to be inquired into further or chewed on? OK, so that's the, the spirit with which I'm inviting you to, to, to um, enter into that. And there's the question in the, in the chat. Maria, when you're ready. Yes, we are opening the, the groups now. Welcome back. Um, if, you're, if your group was anything like ours, somebody was cut off in their prime um, as there were some lovely conversations. So in the few minutes we've got left, uh, I'm just going to suggest that we hear from a few people that nutshell this. You know, what, what if anything, is coming into your awareness as, as a question or a reflection or something you're chewing on that's relative to your practice as a result of today? What's coming up? Well, I'll, I'll offer up one to start quickly, Steve, which for me was the, the just a little bit of um, uh, clarity about uh, being clear with clients about what I need in order to do the, a good job, to do a good, valuable piece of work. And you know, maybe that captures a lot of things that uh, fall under the kind of ethics and morality otherwise. Thanks, Steve. And bye, Helena. I want to I want to uh, bring Isabel Menzies live into the picture. She's she's uh, one of the uh, oldies but goodies from the Tavistock Institute. She's been gone for a while, and I can remember years ago. She's the one who did the research on uh, the nurses in the uh, clin in the clinics and the defenses against the anxiety of dealing with dying patients. If you don't know. She, she wrote something which made me laugh out loud when I read it at the time. And I, it just came back in a conversation I was having with Claire Fisher. She said that there's a, there's a subtle um, uh, dance that goes on between a potential consultant and client where we're feeling for mutual neuroses, totally <laughs> mutual neuroses. And I, Claire and I were sort of talking about, you know, how explicit are you about these ethical issues and da 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 da. And I think by the time you get a job, there's been, sometimes it's explicit, but I think there's a lot of sort of implicit, subtle dancing around a whole range of, of social justice issues, um, how you work with clients, who you involve, who you don't, who's in charge, how much, you know, there's a whole set of stuff that gets sorted in a really subtle, I like that image. I can see Isabel going like this with her hands, you know, mutual, that's all. That's and that's lovely, Jean. And that kind of just makes me think, um, you know, my, 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 my heading for this talk was something about getting under the skin of this. And unless you're getting in touch with your own neuroses, I'd argue you're probably not getting under the skin of your own ethical wrestle. In the last few minutes, anyone else? I mean, that also reminds me this whole idea of the wounded healer, uh, that the real work actually is that the consultant or the analyst is present to his or her own wounding and is able to enter it uh, with the client as the client enters his or her or yeah. the systems, systems, you know, systems wounding. Yeah, my, my just one sentence, my big takeaway uh, from the small group. It's been a fantastic conversation. And just the realization that the consultant work is to stay in the tension of, of all these dilemmas. There's so many dilemmas and to, to stay with that in the body, in the thinking, in the diagnosing, in the intervening, it's just, a whole bunch of dilemmas from start to end. Yeah, it's a lot messier than it looks, isn't it? <laughs> well, maybe it's not dirty consulting, but messy consulting. <laughs> I just wanted to throw in something else, which is 
not to be so captivated because this is a new liberal discourse and in the global south it's a very different discourse mm -hmm. and i think that these preoccupations are very different and i think these dilemmas are very different and i think we need to have uh, a reality check about who isn't present today and um, who are practitioners who uh, would never be um, open to our radars, wouldn't be um, within our idea of what is this consultancy. So Lost you mid flow, I think. I think that's a really great point. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, there is a view that, that you know, for example, OD practice in the global north make some very sweeping assumptions about what's valid in other parts of the world it just, just just don't stack up um for example in terms of you know we encourage our clients here to speak truth to power but you know, challenging senior leaders is very different in in asia pacific to to how you do it here um, but that's a whole different webinar and we've got two minutes last one any last reflection yes thank you steve something which i just like to share is you know, uh, the relationship, uh, me being in an internal practitioner and uh, being in the Middle East, yeah, the relationship built over a period of time and and it provides you access to speak truth to the power, share the assumptions from which you are working on. But the question comes to, how are you utilizing that relationships? And what ethics is behind that? And how many types of ethics we can explore in that yeah. domain? Yeah. Thanks, Phoebe. And I think Phoebe, you know, we had that in, in our small breakout, which is we haven't even gone anywhere near the difference in ethical um, dilemmas that you have as an internal as opposed to an external. That's just another rich inquiry. So I'm going to suggest that we we wrap up there as we're nearly at half past. Um, the recording, I believe, is going to be made available, and Maria, no doubt, will let people know uh, when that's available. I've put into the chat my LinkedIn profile for those of you who I've not put off connecting with me in the real world. Um, feel free to reach out and say hello. It'd be lovely to meet you. Um, and thank you very much for your willingness to come and chew the cud and ruminate on all this stuff. Uh, my sense is this is not a, this should never be an ending of a conversation. This is an inquiry that I hope we're all chewing on in perpetuity as we go about our, our lives and our work. So go well. And I hope to meet some of you in the physical space. Whoa, well, thank that you very thing, much, then. Steve. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I think everybody really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. Thank you.